Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, and uh, thank you everybody for joining me today. Um, so like Maria said, I will be presenting um, some of the work that I did during my PhD. Um, and during my PhD, I focus on climate driver timing and population dynamics, um, specifically plant population dynamics. So it will be a little bit biased towards plants, but I do think that a lot of things that I have to show today is also applicable for other organisms. Right, so in my talk today, I would like to, oh, this will switch slides. There we go. Um, I would like to give you a quick overview. So there's sort of three different sections um, that I will be talking about. So first, I'm sort of, I want to talk about how we select climate driver timing, um, how can we maybe do it better? And then I want to sort of dive a little bit into how modeling more complex uh, climate and vital rate relationships over time uh, can be beneficial to us, um, both in forecasting and in understanding uh, these type of relationships. And then finally, I sort of want to go up a level towards the population level and see how including more complex climate driver time can actually have population level consequences. Uh, but I'm going to start with the very first part. Um, so when we select climate drivers for our population models, uh, a lot of times we spend a lot of time thinking about what sort of climate variable we're interested in. Are we interested in temperature, interested in precipitation? Um, but not as much attention is spent on actually when that specific climate variable might be interested in. So if you look in the literature, and so if you look in the plant literature mostly, uh, what you see is that when we select a climate driver for plant populations, the thing that we are most interested in usually is the most recent full growing season that we have. Uh, a lot of times this is um, selected or chosen because of an a priori expectation. And a lot of times these a priori expectations and assumptions are actually pretty based strongly on um, processes that we know of, or just, just general knowledge that we have. Um, but if you then keep looking a bit further, there's other options. So we also see that sometimes climate during the dormant season uh, is very important. And sometimes it's not just that first year before census that we actually look at, um, that can be very important and determinal, uh, deterministic for your vital rates. But it's also those a few years or one or two years before the census um, so those are called lagged climate drivers, or so climate drivers that occur more than 12 months before the actual census. And so if you, if you look in the literature, these alternatives have been found and have been found with quite some strong support, but they're still, they're not as often found in the population models um, when you look in the general literature. And when I say not as often, and I'm talking about a little bit of a feeling. Um, so the very first thing, thing I did was actually look at it a little bit more systematic. So I did a literature study, and in this literature study, I had 76 studies of plant population uh, studies that had structured population models, and that looked at linking macroclimate to vital rates. And if you look at this study, you see that only 25% of these studies considered the dormant season climate drive. And even less considered the possibility of lagged time window. So that's only 15% of these studies. Um, and I'm not talking about whether or not they found a significant effect. I'm talking about whether or not they reported actually considering the possibility of such a uh, climate driver and the timing of such a climate driver. Now, this is not necessarily a problem uh, because it could be that dormant season and like climate drivers do result in less accurate vital rate models. So the question then is, is okay, do these type of timeframes result in less accurate vital rate models or is there more of a bias towards in the a priori selection for the most recent growing season? And that is sort of the question or sort of the, 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 yeah, the question that drove sort of the very first part of my PhD. So which time windows actually best predict plant vital rates? Um, and to do, 
we got this uh, published uh, a few years ago now. Um, very original title, those that read fast already have all the answers. Um, but for this study, I um, got access to databases of four different species. Uh, the first two, Heliantella, Grigbenevus, and Rosera speciosa, are two mountainous species. And then we have the Imbricata and the Flava, the other two, um, which are two arid species. Now, these were very long term data sets. Uh, the minimum was 12 years, and the longest one is actually Cosera speciosa, which has 47 years of data available. And all, the, all these four species are long lived perennials. So for these four species, we had four different vital rates. So we had the probability of surviving, we had growth. Uh, these are plants, so technically they can also shrink in size, um, but we just call it growth for convenience. And then we also have flower probability and flower numbers. Um, and then for each of these four virates and for each of the four species, I use a model selection method to select the best time frame of the climate variables. Now, the model selection method that I used uh, is the sliding window analysis, and I use that through a very nice package called ClimWin. Uh, and I want to very quickly just go over this method so that you sort of know what the idea is behind this model selection method. So in this sliding window analysis, um, you start out with a certain time range. So in this case, this example has a range of two years. So you think somewhere in these two years, there is clim climate is important for your vital rates. And then you have a certain census month. And then... So from the census month to the two year time range back that you look at. And within that time range, you test and try all possible combinations of time, start and duration. So any sort of combination that you can think of and that is possible, you try that out. Um, which basically means that the very first time window that you try is probably just the very first month, the census month. And then the next option that you try you just add an extra month to that. So you get two months from census and the, the month before that. And then you add another month, you keep adding another month. So you get all these different time windows um, until, for example, you have the full range, because that's also a possibility, all the whole, the whole two years. Then you move up the first date, so you don't look at the census month, but you look one month back. You sort of repeat the whole process, and you just keep doing that until the sort of the very last possible time window to look at would be the very last and single month of your time range. Now, this will give you a few hundred time windows. And for each of these time windows, you would calculate, for example, the mean temperature, mean precipitation in this specific window. And you would then put that into your vital rate. So you would get uh, about 300 different vital rate models, each with a single climate driver as a combination of your variable and the specific time window. And then you have 300 windows and you just take whichever model has the lowest ASC score. And that is sort of how you would uh, find the best window. There's a few extra steps, but we'll not go into that too much. Um, so the results for our four species, um, I'm going to show you an empty graph first because there's a lot of information in these graphs. Um, so for example, if we want to see the results for survival, here on the x-axis, we have time with the census month all the way on the left, and then we go back a few years to the right. And then on the y-axis, we have the four different species. The colored areas, in each bar is actually the time range that we looked at. And the dashed areas are the growing season for each of the respective species. Right, so now for the actual results. Um, there's going to be a few blue lines now that you see right here. Let me see, can you guys see my cursor? Yes, okay, cool. So we have these three blue lines. And the first thing I want to talk about is the line that actually doesn't show up. So we don't have a line for Facera speciosa. Um, like I mentioned, there's so many models that you test. So there's a very high chance that whatever you find might just be a spurious correlation. 
Klimwin and sliding window analysis have some additional tests that you can do. So the window that we found for Facera Spatio is that we could not definitely show that that wasn't a spurious correlation. So we just left that out. The other three did pass the test. So there's a very high chance that this isn't a spurious correlation. And for these three windows, what you see here, Cassandra Flab, for example, it's only a single month, but it's within the most recent growing season. Um, in Bricata, again, very close in the growing, most recent growing season. There's just an extra month uh, on one side. And the same for the Quinquinev. So this is actually very much reflective of what you see in the literature happening right now. Most recent growing season is what a lot of people use. And that's what we actually find here for survival as well, which is great. But then if you go to growth, which is our second five or eight, uh, we see a totally different story. So um, there's two things that I sort of want to point out, two things here that are very interesting. So the first one here is for Capranta flava, which was one of the arid species. We actually see a window of more than 12 months. Uh, and this is very rare for perennial, perennial species. Uh, you do see it happening for tree in the tree literature, um, but it's not something that you see a lot happening in these perennials. But then again, these are very long lived perennials. So it might make sense that there is such a long window where climate can affect uh, the growth of this species. The other one I want to point out is uh, Fasera spaziosa has a very long lagged window. So that is uh, three, four years before the census. Uh, and the interesting thing here is that this is one, it's mostly fully dormant season of the species, but this is also the year where we know that Fasera speciosa actually starts the preformation of leaves. And considering we use leaves as size, so that's actually the thing that we look at at growth, uh, it actually really makes sense that this is actually the time frame where climate would influence your growth uh, probability. So then looking at the next two vital rates, so we have a flower probability here. Again, we see this very long window uh, of more than 12 months for Capranta flava. And sort of the hypothesis that we came up after talking with experts of this species um, is that we think that a wetter dormant season could actually allow for photosynthetic activity during the dormant season, which would be beneficial for this species. Um, but if this is the hypothesis that you're going with, um, as you can see in this case, there are two, whoops, that where is the, there's my question. There's two dormant seasons that are sort of in this um, in this window, but there's also the, the growing season. So if it really is the dormant season that is important, then this method, which just takes the average across the whole uh, time window that we're looking at, might be hiding two separate peaks, both during the dormant season, if that makes sense. Um, and then, Again, for the flower numbers, we see quite a bit of spread in the type of uh, windows that are selected. Um, again, for uh, Fasera speciosa, we see these very long lagged um, uh, windows. And these are just at the beginning and at the end of the dormant season. And this is the mountainous species. This might very well correlate with the dates of snowfall and snow melt in the year that they commit to flowering. Now, and the last one I want to point out is the only one that perfectly fits sort of the assumption that you see in the literature, which is for the flower numbers, Filiantella quinquinervus, right here, this is the only window that perfectly fits the most recent growing season as the window that is selected. So just sort of to summarize these results is what we see when we use a model selection method is that our four species have many different types of time windows. And some of those we have been able to pinpoint occurring around physiological processes, um, but there's definitely a prevalence of dormant season and lag windows, which as I've mentioned a few times now, is very much in contrast with what's actually happening in the most recent growing season. So some of you might now think, well, this is very interesting, but those four species are long-lived perennials. So maybe this is just happening because we're looking at long-lived perennials. That's a very good observation. And that's actually something that we also looked at for a little bit 
these are very much still preliminary results. I still need to do some work on this. Um, but I do want to show you some of the results here um, because I supervised a great student, master student, Conrad Adler, who did his master thesis on this subject. And what he did is he repeated the analysis that I just showed you for a few additional species. And then we wanted to see if there was some sort of correlation between generation time of the species and the mean lag of the windows that we found. So there's a, fortunately no clear cut answer yet, uh, but what we, what we see is that in some cases there is actually a negative relationship. Uh, it's, a very, it's a very small slope, but still you see that across generation time, we actually don't see a longer lag, we actually see less lag, um, but that's only for survival. For the other vital rates, for example, growth, and flower probability, we do see an increase, a small increase, mind you, but an increase in the average lag of the windows compared to generation time. Um, but the thing to point out here is, uh, there we go, sorry. So there appears to be uh, equally lagged, sorry, lagged windows appear to be equally important for short and long um, lived plant species. Um, and we think that this is happening because there is both direct effects of climate that's actually affecting the individual that you're looking at, but there's also a lot of literature available on sort of trans transgenerational effects, uh, feedback systems and all of that. Um, the thing to point out is that the shortest generation time that we currently have is 6.4 years. And I'm using this opportunity for a slightly selfish reason for a quick call out, if anybody happens to have annual or biannual uh, demographic data sets available and would be happy to collaborate, please reach out to me. Um, because this is very much something that we that I would still uh, be interested in looking at uh, for now. Um, but yeah, well, if you sorry, if we go back to these graphs, you see that um, even for the shorter lift, there's still a relatively long lagged window on average that we see. So that means that even though what we would consider more shorter terms, that would still be, it would still be beneficial to consider la long lagged windows, so windows that occur one or two years before your actual census. Mm -hmm. Right, so to very quickly wrap this up. Um, so what we see is that dormant season and lag climate drivers is very much prevalent in plant vital rates. Which brings us sort of to the second section um, where we look at how can we sort of increase the complexity of climate and vital rate relationships over time and what would that bring us as we try to forecast the populations. Um, now the Sliding window analysis that I used in the previous section, like I mentioned, you take the average temperature, average precipitation across the whole time frame that you're at that point considering. And that is great because it's uh, easy to understand. The package is great, it's easy to use, um, but it doesn't give you a lot of complex complexity within the time frame that you're looking at. Um, so there are other options for model selections of climate windows. One of these is the functional linear models. Now, and what is a functional linear model? The functional linear model models the effect of climate as a smooth spline identifying the contribution of each month to the vital rate. That is maybe a little bit complex, but if you, sh if you show it in a graph, it might be a bit easier to understand. So what you see here, sense in this case, sense is on time is on the x-axis, census is on the right. There was a quick, quick flip from what we saw previously. Um, but what you see here is that in the first nine-ish months um, before census, uh, SBI has a positive effect, and then there's a few months where SBI actually has a negative effect on your vital rate, and then. Um, going from two years before your census to three years before your census, SPI actually at the end has a positive effect. This is how you would sort of read this type of graph. And this gives you a much more um, complicated relationship that you can model across time 
uh, with your vital rate. And I sort of want to show you one of, one of my studies that I did uh, where I used the same uh, model. So the study I want to talk about is where I looked at the inclusion of microhabitat interactions. Um, providing new insights into the population dynamics of an endangered herbaceous species under climate change. And this is cu currently on the review, so fingers crossed for that. Um, but the species that we looked at is Trachytopalum austriagum. It's a very nice, beautiful little uh, plant here, beautiful purple flowers. Um, and it has a very large range. It reaches from northeast Spain all the way through Central Europe and then actually all the way to Turkey as well. Um, but within this very large range, there are some very scarce, small and declining populations. And the populations that I looked at for my study are populations in the Czech Republic. Um, and here they exist in open rocky habitats. And the assumption is that they are threatened by shrub and tree encroachment. This assumption is there because the open habitats themselves are being threatened and therefore they assume that it's the species because uh, it needs these open rocky habitats. The species is also being threatened. Um, and as such, it's actually currently under active management where they remove um, encroaching individuals. So for this um, study, we have a lot of data available. So the data that I used in my study is from 2003 to 2019. But uh, Tomasz actually went out this year, so he's still currently actively uh, collecting data. Uh, and again, we have quite a few vital rates in our study. So we have survival, growth, flower probability, flower numbers, and then we also actually have seed probability and seed numbers. Um, and then because we were talking about this encroachment, we also have data on the microhabitat of each of the individuals. So we have the level of shading that these individuals experience. Now, and the aim of the whole study um, is to investigate the effect of climate and other abiotic factors on uh, Austriacum rates and population dynamics. And then the second part was to um, forecast population dynamics on the future climate. Now, I'm going to spoil the study a little bit for you because I'm not going to go through the whole thing. But the interesting thing here is what we found is that despite the fact that it's an open habitat species, localities with different and especially higher levels of shading have a higher chance of surviving in the face of climate change. This is a very interesting result, but what I actually want to focus on is a little bit more the vital rates and this complex relationship that we modeled with uh, climate. So I'm going to show you the results for the vital rate number of seeds. So here we modeled the number of seeds um, with time on the x-axis, since this is all the way on the right, and then we go back two years. Uh, and then we have the coefficient estimate of potential evapotranspiration on the y-axis. Now we have a few different lines. These are different levels of shading. So yellow is, is no shading. Uh, dark purple is um, relatively high for these type of population, high levels of shading. Um, and for me, at least, the interesting thing that we see in, this, uh, in these results is that we have sort of this flip happening. So if you look at five months before census to what is it, 15 months before census, you actually see that having low levels of shading, which is the yellow line, is actually, um, in that case, potentially evapotranspiration has a negative effect on your number of seeds. Um, but on the high levels of shading, it's actually perfectly all right to have uh, higher evolved transpiration. Um, and then there's this flip happening around five months before the census where it totally flips around. So in this case, having low levels of shading, high potential evolved transpiration is actually a really good thing for the number of seeds that you produce. So what is happening here? Well, what we think is happening is now in that first period, we actually think that the water availability might be limiting. So in that case, if you don't have shading, you're right there out in the open and there's a very high evapotranspiration, you won't have a lot of water, you won't be able to build up your resources that you might need for the seeds production. Um, but being under high shading, 
protects you from that evapotranspiration, which will give you more than enough water. And then it will also um, give you enough uh, to higher temperatures uh, to sort of do whatever you want to do to build up those type of resources. But then those five months before the census, well, at some point, if you want to produce seeds, you do actually need pollinators to visit. Um, and what you see is that if you're under a lot of shading, the visitation is a lot lower for the, from the pollinators. And we do know that Dracocephalum uh, osliacum is actually pollen limited. Um, so in that case, for those last few months when you actually do need to be visited, and actually do need to have pollen deposited on your flowers, um, it's actually better to be out there in the open so that the pollinators might actually be able to find you and visit you. Um, so the interesting thing about using these type of more complex relationships uh, between your climate driver and your vital rate across a wider range of time is that you can really sort of try to tease apart all these different mechanisms that might be happening and might be happening at different times uh, rather than throwing all of them on the same heap. Um, yeah, so that sort of wraps up this second section. So we already saw that dormant season and like climate drivers are quite prevalent. Um, but now I also want to add that including longer timeframes and more complex relationships uh, is absolutely possible in your analysis and in your forecasts. Um, and it allows you to formulate some new hypotheses that you can explore. And that brings us um, to the uh, last section uh, that I want to talk about, sort of the last topic, um, which is what sort of population level consequences could there be for including more complex climate driver timing? And for that, I sort of want to go back to some of the first figures that I showed you. Um, these are the figures that I showed you all the way in the beginning, except that now they are rearranged for the groups by species rather than by value. And why do I do this? Well, I want to show you this because you can see that it's not just very diverse between species. It can also be quite diverse within the single species. And in this case, the autocorrelation of the climate might actually also be driving some of the vital rate correlations. Now, why might this be um, very important for population level um, uh, matrices? Well, if you look in the literature, um, it's very clear that vital rate correlations uh, can be very uh, important in your population growth rates. Um, we, a lot of times we see a very strong effect on population growth rates from these vital rate correlations. But as I mentioned, uh, in these type of scenarios with these type of diverse time windows, it is the climate order correlation that is in part going to drive your vital rate correlations. Uh, and this is interesting because climate autocorrelation is still debated a lot. Sometimes people find effects, sometimes people don't find effects. Sometimes they find a positive effect, sometimes they find a negative. So it's very much still trying to figure out how it works. Um, and a consequence of that is that sometimes, um, often, people sort of tend to not include autocorrelation. Auto Why? It, because it's a little bit more complicated. You need to spend a lot more thought on it. Um, and as a lot of literature has shown you, the effects are so small, you might as well not. There's, there's not going to be that much differences on the population growth rates. Um, but that might not be true if you get a situation like this, where you have such diverse climate driver timing. Um, so, which is why for the, sort of the last part of my uh, PhD thesis, I looked at, okay, so how does timing diversity in climate drivers influence population dynamics? And this also got published recently. Um, yes, again, very original title. Um, so, for what I did in this study, so this was a purely simulation-based study. I simulated population dynamics using a very simple two-stage life cycle. And I simulated these life cycles uh, across an increasing range of climate variability. Um, and I included, I, I, I included or I simulated uh, two types of climate responses. 
and there it is. So in the blue, we have sort of have the control responses where both vital rates respond to the same, same time frame. Um, and we also have a varied response where survival and fecundity have sort of what, have a lag between them. So survival takes a year longer to actually show the response to climate compared to fecundity. Um, and then just to throw in everything that we could, we included three different levels of vital correlation. Uh, these levels were based on the uh, maximum, minimum autocorrelations that you actually see across the world. Um, and we also included vital rate correlations, both positive and negative. And what does this mean? This means either survival and fecundity both respond positively to your climate variable, or one responds negatively, whereas the other responds positively. Um, in that case, you would have a negative uh, vital rate correlation. Um, so these are the results, um, and what you see here on the x-axis is an increase from zero to one in climate variance, and then on the y-axis we have the population growth rate. So the first thing that you'll notice is that there's a very big drop in population growth rate with increasing climate variance, which is great because that's uh, all the theory says that that's what should be happening. Um, but there's two some sort of very interesting things to, to point out. Well, first of all, there is a difference between control and varied. In this case, we see that varied usually has a higher population growth rate than the control. Uh, and the second thing that is very interesting is that for the varied, we see these three different lines. These three different lines are different levels of autocorrelation. So we have a negative um, 0 0.6 that is actually has the highest population growth rate. And then we have no autocorrelation, and then we have a positive 0.6 auto climate autocorrelation. Now, these three levels are also there for the control. They're just so the effect of autocorrelation is just so small, as a lot of times you see in the literature, that it's all in the same blue line right here. So it is all right there. And the relative effect of auto correlate climate autocorrelation is actually 10 times bigger in the varied simulations compared to the control. Um, right, so and this was on the positive co-variation of the uh, vital rates. So all vital rates respond positively to climate. If you change that to one response positive and one response negatively to your climate variable, um, we see a flip happening. So in this case, uh, a varied response actually results in a lower population growth rate. The thing that doesn't change is that we still see about a 10 times bigger effect of autocorrelation. Again, we see very clear differences in the autocorrelation uh, in the very uh, simulations, and almost no differences in the control. All right, and there you go. Right, so to sort of summarize that in words, um, so if climate driver timing varies across five rates, then climate autocorrelation will affect population growth rate through vital rate correlations. And the effect size is actually 10 times bigger than just um, through pure autocorrelation within the vital rates. Uh, and that brings me sort of to this final and then third wrap up message uh, of this presentation, which is that complex climate driver timing can have population level consequences. Um, so you should definitely include them. And if you do, do not forget about climate autocorrelation. Right, and with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and I would be happy to answer any questions. Hmm. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Sana. That was really interesting. Uh, I'm sure there will be questions. I definitely have some, but um, are there any questions? I see clapping hands, but no questions yet. While I'm giving people uh, some time to think about it, <laughs> I will start with a question because uh, so uh, this is something that um, so the, the choosing of the of the climate window is something that's actually quite relevant because uh, we've just tried it with a PhD student um, who's uh, we've been working on on a carnivorous plant species my 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 little side project and basically. Um, <clears throat> One issue that we encountered is that um, ev eventually we ran out, like we didn't know how to interpret things anymore. 
Um, you know, like that because um, often, uh, if you're perhaps not quite familiar with the physiology of the species, um, and um, it's quite the, the farther back you go, and if you do it for each vital rate, it's quite differ difficult to interpret. Um, you know, if, if there's something that, um, like flowering, for instance, was the, the best window was like a year, um, a year back, and it's just, uh, we couldn't interpret it in any shape or form. So in the end, we just went back uh, to hypothesis driven windows, you know, like within or just just a few months prior to the growing season or something so how you know um what, what is your opinion on that like the interpretability of these types of things yeah so that is definitely those are definitely hard especially the longer lagged um i've had the um the luck that a lot of the literature that i've been able to base some of the hypothesis on they've gone through a lot of these research there's been um a very there's a very nice sequence of papers um from um for sure et al 2018 and then mm -hmm. Crohn, i think as well where they look at the lagged results and that's also like a year or two before that um where they've been able to pinpoint it on like non-structural carb carb carbohydrates and how oh. depletion of those would then result in a lagged decrease in survival and all of that um, so I definitely think that uh, some of these windows that you would find two years, three years, there, I think there might definitely be something there, um, but it's going to be very hard and you would then actually have to either be lucky and have a species that does have preformation or something that's happening, uh, uh, preformation of leaves or um, flower banks, anything like that, then it's very easy to pinpoint. Uh, but if it doesn't have anything of that, you would have to go into these structures. And then a lot of times, I think, if a species doesn't have those very obvious processes, it would be something like a depletion of resources or feedback systems uh, where you see, especially with plants, mm -hmm. with the soil, where you get these sort of type of systems. And they those are incredibly hard to to find and they're incredibly hard to to look at especially if you're there as a demographer if you're trying to forecast population it's sort of a totally different field that you would have to collaborate with um yeah. so so yeah that was a very long answer but i think so i think a lot of times it might really be there um the question is whether or not we can build up on it and if we can actually find out why it is happening um but even if you might not be able to find those very long ones, um, just opening up the possibility of, of trying to look for something mm -hmm. other than you've been using for the last 10 years um, is, I think, already a really big step. Yeah. It doesn't straight away have to be these very long lagged windows and very complex um, um, relationships. Just just so, slowly yeah. start thinking about other options, yes. Yeah, no, I, I, yes, I completely agree. That's, that's, that's probably exactly the point, opening your um, possibilities a bit better. Uh, I see a hand raised by John Jackson. Go ahead. Hi, Sonia. Hi, hi. Thank you. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Um, thank you for such a nice talk. I was going to ask you about um, a problem that I'd encountered a little bit with lag defects, um, which was the fact that we sent we often censor uh, sent do a census for demography on a particular date and then assume um a lag defect behind from that but actually the date at which if we take survival for example the the organism might have died at any point within the last year so the um the window the like effective window that you're looking at in terms of where the lag defect might actually influence them may not be consistent just but it's just based on like how we're doing the demographic sampling um and i just wondered if you'd if if you'd encountered that at all and I, yeah i don't know if there's a good way to handle it uh, yet <laughs> but but if you've yeah, yeah ever thought about yeah. that i mean in it, oh sorry i was just going to say in typical examples you'll see like you know, a lot of mortality events or whatever happen at a particular time of the year, those are also seasonal. So that's kind of one way to get around it that people use, but I don't know if that's the case. Yeah, always, but sorry. 
So I actually haven't looked at that particular example where, I mean, obviously they don't die just the day before you go out for your senses. Um, the one thing I have looked at is because, um, uh, and it is sort of related to your question, the thing I have looked at is that um, if these windows occur around physiological processes, um, then phonology, just the fact that those Physi physiological processes can have different timing across year or across populations should also mean that those windows might differ across years or across populations. And I think that's sort of the same problem there because I can, I mean, if I say it this way, it makes sense, but I've had a little bit of time to look into that and we haven't been able to find any uh, concrete results there. We haven't been able to find any sort of that sort of relatively moving, win relatively moving windows sort of thing. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think there also the problem is the sort of the coarseness of the data. So we only go out once a year and a lot of times we also only use monthly data. Um, so in my example with the phonology, if the phonology is, has a range of like a week or two, then the chance that you will be able to find that with monthly data is very low. Um, so I think there's, it's a slightly different example, but I think both of them have the same sort of source of the problem because we just, we're we using data that's too coarse. So the time steps that we're using is both for the census and for the um, climate is probably too big to be able to find those type of things. Um, so ideally, of course, you would go out every day and then you could actually yeah. use the day that you see that that speak that that plant is turning brown or whatever you want to use it as okay now it's officially dead um you would be able to use that day um but i think um yeah that is that's going to be very interesting once we maybe get some remote sensing set up um and more fine-tuned yeah but yeah for sure thank you thank you Another question, anyone else? I had a question. Thanks, Sani, for the great talk. Um, in the lab that I am part of, uh, we look at trees and thinking about climate legs with trees a lot. So I'm really excited to look at your global climate change paper. Um, in, that, in the literature review that you did for that, does that include were you looking at trees or was it shrubs, grasses? Um, if I'm correct, perennial herbaceous species. Okay. So no trees. Okay, great. And then the other thing I was really interested in was that um, I think you had mentioned you had used an R package mm -hmm. to look at those windows. And can you say the name of that again? Yes, Glimwin. I can quickly hit the book. Things down, I can quickly hit it. Like climate window, um, yeah, right. Dim win. Um, it was developed by Bailey and Van der Poel, uh, and it's a great R package. It has a great tutorial that walks you through everything, and it has quite a lot of different options. So what I used was sort of the basic uh, thing, and there's some some ways you, that you can actually increase the capacity. Yeah, great. Thanks. I'm looking forward to sharing that with the lab too. Frank Pennekamp has a question. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks again. Uh, I also very much enjoyed your talk, Sanna. Very, very nice. So I, I really, um, I really got interested in this functional linear analysis that you presented um, because I, I think it, it looked like a great way to capture like the the history that affects, let's say, um, a kind of population, I guess, or maybe even individuals. So my my question would be um, when you do that kind of analysis um what, what's the kind of level of ecological um, organization that you're capturing is it like individual or is it rather population level um i would i would say it's a uh, population level um so well i mean it's it's a so it's it's something that you add to your regression. So I think it also might. So what I've been using, I've been using it more as on a population level. 
Um, but I think you might be able actually to, to tune that down into uh, individual level. The problem there is that you, it is very data hungry. Um, so it will depend on how much data you have, whether or not like that is possible. Yeah, yeah. So that that was exactly what what I I was um, wondering. So to me, it also seemed that it's possible to do it on both levels. That maybe, but that maybe on population level, um, th there could be factors where it's like obscured by the kind of history experienced by the different individuals. So if it's from like one location, it's probably sufficiently homogeneous to be representative. But um, do you know, like, is there any study where people do that for um, kind of different individuals? And um, so that I think that would allow to basically um, disentangle a bit this, this kind of effect of history on, on different um, individuals and how, um, well, how large that is. And um, yeah, so. Yeah, so I'm not aware of a study doing that. Um, so yeah, no, I, I, can't, I can't answer that. I don't know. Uh, the only thing I do know is that it is, it, you, as long as you have enough data, you, you, you might be able to do it, but the, the main question would be the data. All right. Sorry, sorry to interject. I did try and do it in my PhD, but it it didn't work very well. <laughs> so, so but with the elephants, so we have we we tried to do it for individual demographic histories for with, with a functional linear approach, but it was it it was a bit of a mess. Um. So yeah, that that's that's the chapter, the last chapter that I haven't really had time to look at again uh, since then. But yeah. <laughs> All right. Cool. Because it's so data hungry. Yeah, I think I think it says it all. Uh, the last chapter that he hasn't looked at yet. <laughs> the tragedy. Yes. I have one. Uh, so far, I see no hands. But I have a quick question. So, um, uh, do you? Uh, you probably mentioned it with um, with the study in Czech Republic. But uh, so, do you do interactions between climate and say density? And how this affects your results? Because it's another thing I always because some of the um, I you know some of these climatic lag effects may actually be um, uh, sort of bio biotic drift that are uh, already uh, captured by density effects or something. You know, um, yeah. I was yeah. wondering um, again. Very quick answer. No, I haven't done that um, for the for the um, targets of farming. We don't really have the data for that. Um, well, well, we might be able to, but um, very close. But yeah, no, we, we I haven't done that yet. Uh, but that's definitely something that um that you would um, that is possible because of those. Uh, it's the same with this these um depletion of resources. It's such there's so many steps in between your actual effect of climate and ways what is actually happening. Um. That, that is definitely also a possibility that you can look at when you see these large uh, windows. Yep. Yeah. Anyone else? One final question for me. <laughs> well, uh, so do managers actually take your study serious for the? Um, Czech Republic one, because it so, has management implications, right? For the yeah, uh, exactly. or, yeah. So uh, Tomáš, my co-author, and uh, the person who's been going out into the field for twenty years, um, he has very close ties with the um, conservation office there, uh, where the populations are. We also had um, they also do their own monitoring of that species and some other species. So they were actually out there in the field the year that I joined them as well. Um, and Tomaj has been talking with them. Um, so the people at the local office, uh, they're definitely interested. They have asked Tomaj for a few updates along the way as well. Um, so I hope they'll take it seriously. There's some some caveats because what we what we are observing, um, there is it's currently under active management. So we have high levels of shading. But that is still under active management, so it's it's very hard for us to say. Well, the high levels of shading is is good, uh, but don't stop doing everything because we haven't actually observed it in a fully shaded area. Um, but 
so we, we are talking with them. Uh, the main question will be, um, we, we talk, we're talking with the local office and wherever the policy is being made, um, yeah. Tomas is still, you know, we're, we're, Tomas is working on it because he's, he's very much interested in um, translating these scientific results to actual management practices. Yeah. Okay, thank you.